Andrew Hogue here for andrewhogue.com, Australia's only dedicated 24-7 rock metal radio station. And as you know, this station is 24-7. We get hit with lots and lots of music around the globe. Some of it's great, some of it sounds like about two other bands, and some of it actually sounds incredibly original and different, which certainly pricks up my ears. And I was really, really wrapped to finally get my ears around the new project, long-awaited, called Menace, featuring uh, Mr. Mitch Harris. Well, he's pretty much the brainchild behind uh, the release. The new album is called Impact Velocity. It's just been released and I do have Mitch, my good friend, on the line to uh, pick his brain about the great record and everything else that went into this uh, amazing offering. G'day, Mitch. Welcome to andrewhogue.com. G'day, g'day. How you doing, man? <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing super well. And like I said, you know, we get hit with so much music. And as you know, there's more bands now than ever before. Uh, and to me, you kind of got to dig a little bit deeper these days to find a lot more originality and uh, things that sort of stand left of centre. And uh, in my opinion, Menace is exactly that. Uh, it's a huge breath of fresh air, uh, well, for the ears at least. And um, again, uh, congratulations. It's a fantastic offering. I know this has certainly uh, been a lot of work for you to uh, put this uh, project together, and it's certainly a lot of your life's experiences has gone into this uh, record as well. So fill us in on when did you think the time was right to finally unleash Menace? Hmm. Well, when we did, I was working on the songs for Utilitarian, the last Napalm album. <clears throat> and uh, we, we, I had this house with a workspace finally, and it was like my biggest dream to just recording in this dingy old attic. I had this little setup and just recording guitar riffs, basically. And I'd had like probably five or seven songs from dating back to like 1997 things that i thought had something in common songs that i held on to because it just seemed a little too mid-paced or even like slow and like what's the word more melancholy kind of stuff where i felt it needed strings and orchestral things and electronic sounds undertones overtones and some kind of melodic singing where the the vocals added an extra element of emotion and expression where which made reinforced the lyrics and made it something special i don't know as opposed to like the fact that even though i'm in a very extreme intense band it's like obviously you know people don't feel like that 24 hours a day around the clock and when i get special feelings about some songs that have an epic vibe to it and i'm like wow there's something about it something simple and looking for something minimal that can be built upon instead of like frantic and so many changes that it's difficult for the vocals to work. So I thought these songs had that in common. And so I, I sat on them for a long time thinking, you know, what am I ever going to do with this? You know, I still need to find the right singer at some point. And then I started uh, uh, trying to finish off the record with another set of like seven, 10 songs and also work on the napalm song. So basically I would pick up the guitar, just push record, go in there and I say, okay, I'm going to record for 20 minutes a day, every day. And that'll be my standard routine. And if things are going well, then I'll just carry on until I run out of ideas or, you know, get bored playing it or, you know, need to go make some food or pick up the kids from school or whatever. But I wouldn't listen to anything. I would just play and then record. And then after about two or three months of that, I was like, okay, if from what I remember, there was a lot of moments and a lot of natural changes and things that happened like five consecutive parts in a row or like some things that I just, I don't know, I get more of a vibe when I'm playing things. I try not to look at what I'm playing and go, oh, that's just, you know, one, three, four, the same old thing. It's, it's like I just feel it and just kind of, I don't know, you get this feeling it could be a color, it could be a light or something like that, a vibration or something. And then it was all in my head. I was like, I think I covered every angle I wanted for Napalm as well as like there were other moments where I thought like, well, that has potential to build on the vocal side. So let's see what this is going to be like. And, you know, so and I, I was like, OK, now I'm going to listen through and edit everything and just like cut it up into small pieces and rearrange it and try and build structures out of it as bad as it sounds all choppy fucked up out of time or whatever it might have taken like 16 times to play the riff and sequence to where i was like oh i finally 
played it how I was like how it how it should be, move on to the next part, and then so you listen it through all this garbage and like yeah okay, oh wow that sounds like a nineteen eighty eight sort of executioner obituary style riff and it's still it's a decent song but you know that's not the direction I want this blah 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 I'm like oh this is a good one and then finally I come across this piece and I'm like ah that's the piece I remember from when I was playing it way back when and then like I wouldn't listen to it again I would just arrange it and move on to the next track and then after this it took me three months to edit that together and I wound up with about a hundred songs which was like I'd say at least 60% of it was scrap, really just whatever. It's just the heat of the moment type of stuff. But some things just hit exactly where I was trying to go with this. So I was like, okay, well, priority is get the napalm stuff running and be like, okay. So I I edited all the 100 songs and I chose my top 10 for napalm and then started putting them together. And I got to this song called The Wolf I Feed. And I was like, yeah, there's something about this song that I got a real feeling from it, like a real drive. But also there was one part that had a some kind of melodic section. I was like, that'll be, that should be some kind of singing part. So I was like, okay, I'm going to try and write the lyrics to this. Cause I, I mapped it out in a way where I think I know how it should go. So, and within five seconds of trying this vocal melody, I was like, Oh my God, I just wrote a vocal melody just like that. It reminds me of Bjork, which is a damn good thing in my book. And it probably obviously won't sound anything like it, but I had this, that same kind of feeling from it. So I was like, Hmm, well, when I go in the studio, I'm going to lay down the guide vocals, you know, to show Barney the idea. But then I was also working on different vocal tones from we'd been touring for a while. And I was like, yeah, there's something I never tried, a different style on this Napalm record. So let me approach the verses like that. And the, there's the singy bit. Hold on. Let me do the singy bit first before I thrash my whole vocal cords. And, and then and I was like, by the way, this is not an underlay idea. This is not something to be like pulled back in the mix and screamed over and just an underlying thing. This is a part that I feel precious about that needs to be like, you know, the main part. And it doesn't want any screaming over it or anything. So let me try that first. And if you guys think it's good, it was me and Shane and Russ. And I was like, yeah. And then we'll go on to that. And by the end of it, Shane was in the back throwing the horns and stuff. And he was just like, yeah, man. Wow. Oh, my God. And then, so I was like, okay, so it's okay then. So we'll move on to the screaming bits. And I did them. And then, so basically we just sat on it, listened to it. And we were almost like celebrating in a way because it was like a groundbreaking thing. Something I've always kind of wanted to do, but never had the courage to try. Or it would seem out of place or something. It's just not that kind of band or it sounds too emo or all these other things. It's like, it, it's a touchy subject that shit. So, and it shouldn't be really. But anyways, one morning, Barney came in to do his vocals, and, and I was like, had a late night, and he was standing there over my bed, like, yeah, I'm here, man, and, uh, you know, let me hear what you've done, and I was like, oh, my God, oh, my God, I just woke up, oh, shit, what am I going to do? I shit my pants, you know, and I was like, okay, okay, here's the lyrics, and play the song, and he listened to it, and he was like, oh, well, he said, I, I kind of like the way he sang that there, he said, I wouldn't be able to sound like that, so maybe you should just do the whole entire track and just leave what you've done. I like it. I was like, well, yeah, there's still some weak points. It needs this here. It needs your vocals too, because that that's like the thing that I envisioned, you know? So otherwise I would have used it for something else. So he was like, yeah, sure. Show me what. And he tried it. And then, yeah. And it was, and there was another track too, uh, by orders of magnitude. There was no clean singing in that, but anyways, afterwards it, I was just like, wow, I can't believe it's, it's finally happened. And I was like, what am I going to do? It's like, I really, I think I found a trick because I, I l analyzed the riff I sang over and I was like, ah, it's one of these chords. And hmm, there's some other songs I have with that chord. And like, I wonder hmm, if I span it out slower and leave more space for vocals to build, then maybe I can do all the vocals for it. And at least, I mean, after a while, it's kind of weird when you, you write about lyrics that are really, really personal to you. It's like, it's like a public diary, you know, it's like personal stuff and, and you pass it on to someone else. And like, it's like in the pop world, you know, they buy these songs from the people who wrote them and they're great tracks, but it's how can the artist really feel and understand what they went through? So I was like, you know, it's not about the quality of singing or vocal training or anything like that. It's a case of having the need to express yourself and voice your opinion and a place to vent and also show a different side of yourself like, and begin to understand it's like a psychological sort of, uh, to me, it was like some kind of um, therapy, you know? And I was like, you know, 
everyone hates the sound of their own voice and you know there are a lot of people in in our field will either be shocked or they'll just hate it because it's like against the law to, to do anything melodic or maybe no maybe i should give people more credit and that, that they'll like appreciate it that a i did this in menace where i could um not bring napalm death down with with me of like what i personally wanted to explore so i was like so yeah it's safe to do whatever i want really i mean obviously i'll expect criticism i don't know if i'll get support but i don't care if they like or hate my voice as long as i hear it back and i and it doesn't annoy me then i guess that i could live with that so and i was more concerned about catching the energy of the song and the mood and the feeling and using the words as a storyboard to create a visual story for people to kind of um relate to it's something that relates to them personally where it's like written almost in, in from a different viewpoint where the the listener is in the song and it's about them you know i always like when when you're a kid and you watch these movies like star wars or something you're like it's about me i wonder if i can use the force or whatever it should be about <laughs> them and how it relates to them and it could be the one line or the one phrase or the whole entire album you know when you're going through this terrible separation or anxiety or overcoming loss or hardship or, or just alone and in isolation or, or something or maybe life is going perfect and everything's great and he shared this with friends and it creates memories it's a way of like bringing those memories out into a feeling that that kind of translates somehow through frequencies you know so basically i went with that angle on the whole thing, which is kind of deep if anyone would look at it like that. But, uh, you know, there was a lot of justifying and should I or shouldn't I and like having doubts and like I, I always figured, well, I'm obviously going to scream on the album, too, because it's going to that would be a dynamic. You know, it's like it gets also boring, maybe the same kind of vocal style for 50, 60 minutes. So I was like, OK, I'm going to try a var variety of voices. I don't know what works or doesn't work until I try it. And building on layers and understanding harmonies and keeping songs basic so you can make more of the vocals. And so it was like, okay, all that went into it. And it was a case of, well, I justified it now in the lyrics. And it's like, I'm going to stand up, I'm going to go for it. And, you know, trying stuff at home and then showing it to Russ. And obviously it was a mess. I mean, I work in a really weird way. It's like a spontaneous, it has to be spur of the moment. Like I'll, I'll have like, well, I had about 200 pages of lyrics, which were like some had really good, strong, consistent verses and others were just lines here and there. And so I would basically put the song in like five times and just sing over it every time, whatever the lyrics as they came, whatever happened to be in front of my eyes that I managed to fit to the part and connect the mood and just like, yeah, OK. And then you, you do that for five songs, you know, until you get to the end of the lyrics and you go, OK. Now let's listen back. And you, can you imagine how time consuming it is? That's like 15 minutes of real time music and then another 15 minutes just to listen to it back. And then another 15 minutes to take your favorite parts and cut out all the crap that didn't work. And then I'd be like, ah, okay, if I take this part from here and put it there and put it there and put it, it's like I have a, a basic idea now. These are the melodies, these are the strongest lyrics and I'm not happy with those lyrics. So I'm gonna fine tune them and make them, uh, you know, like I have a, I'm pretty anal about poetry and symmetric sort of rhythm patterns and syllables and placements and adjectives and not try not to repeat yourself. So I, I fine tune all the lyrics and I'm like, okay, now let's try this for real. And then, then I would bring that into Russ and he would go like, yeah, man. Oh, wow. That's a good idea. And we would try it for real. And then, you know, cause I needed a coach. I needed a, a mentor and and he was good for that and he knows more about music theory than i do because me personally i don't have a clue it's never interested to me it's all about feeling and you know i've always thought that that would limit me as much as it could help me so then you know i was working with nick the guy who played strings on it he was a one-man band from bologna valentia and he played violin and he uh, cello and viola and he was saying yeah I would love to play on it so I would send him the songs with the vocals and and he was giving me lots of uh, constructive criticism and really uh, confidence building and stuff like that to, by the end of the album I kind of figured out my strong points and my weak points and what I wanted to do and and he was a big part of that and um, and, and of course he has all this theoretical skill so here I am 
this kind of noise dude trying to do something melodic and I have no clue what I'm doing. And then he plays these compositions over it and I'm like, oh my God, it's like a, some classical composition now. It's like m mute the guitars and drums and just the strings and vocals and it's like Phantom of the Opera. I was like, oh my God, who the hell would have expected that? No, don't use that as a first impression because people won't just won't know how to take it. So just leave the guitars and drums in. It's definitely rock influence. You know, you can't escape that. That's what you do. But, you know, it's like when you take the melodies, it doesn't matter what instrument it is. It's, it's something, if the song has that, that right feel, then, you know, then we build on that. So, yeah, I guess I just built on that. And with Russ's help, it was like, okay, now we did all that based around my drum machine programming and these ideas, you know, a way of like having everything in line so p other people can play to it. And we were doing lots of file sharing and and we needed a drummer because Braun Daler from Mastodon was the guy that s committed to it initially. We, we'd been talking about it for years and I finally got it together. And then his deadlines were really crazy with Mastodon and you know, he's like the front man of the band in some ways. He handles all these aspects. And I know his life is busy. And to do an album like this is a full time commitment. I mean, I spent a whole year, maybe a year and a half, putting it together at home in between napalm shows and tours and having three amazing children and just run myself around the clock, clock, just put them to bed. And then at midnight, I would start working on songs till seven in the morning, take them to school, have a quick nap, and do the same thing. So I ran myself into the ground doing it because it seemed like, well, this is the only thing that's really going to help me out of this rut. And I'm going in circles and I'm actually psychologically getting to a point where I understand myself. I see where I went wrong and I can see what's important and I can see what I took for granted. So it was really more about bettering myself as a person and somehow trying to start again fresh and with something new with a different name that people won't have preconceived notions about like oh yeah well i had expectations oh it's me to exceed it's nothing like the first album it's not as good it's not what i expected i like it but and it's like it's just goes in circles man so i thought let's start with something new and i've had this idea menace for like ever since 97 but i just never kind of did anything with it because it just i was looking for the magical team of people and Russ was always in there and Shane was always in there. I mean, Shane helped me to choose out of the hundred songs, really, like which ones made sense. And you can't imagine, that's a lot of time. I mean, it took me like nine hours to listen through to all the hundred songs and then quickly make a decision what utilitarian should be and blah, blah, blah. So, and then I had to join up all these electronic songs that had something in common. So I'd put guitar on that that didn't sound for the sake of it, like To the Marrow, for example. Now this song I wrote in 19, well, uh, 99, and it was uh, all electronic. It was like I was doing a lot of soundtrack music. I was, uh, I learned about video editing. I got a degree in that. And so I was like, yeah, I'm gonna make a soundtrack movie. And that song just stayed with me. And I was like, yeah, I'd love to put some guitar on it, but not just some cheesy little generic ministry style, like sounding like some industrial thing. I was like something, so basically, I, I put the, all these guitar tracks on it. I tried all these ideas and, and pieced it together eventually. Where In fact, there were two guitar lines running simultaneously through the entire song. And it, it was like an epic sort of moody thing. So I wanted to build on that. And I, I finally finished them after two weeks, which is ridiculous, unheard of for me. But um, I was like, yeah, OK, I'm happy with that. I was listening back going, oh, my God, I'm getting goosebumps. And I got like a couple of tears because it just reminds me of certain things. And I was like, oh, and I heard this massive screech and a crash and a bang, a scream, like someone crashed into a garbage truck or something. And I was like, a, a dumpster or something. And I look out the window, I'm like, I don't see anything in my peripheral. I looked around. We lived on this busy road, really, and I, I, it was an old Victorian house and really, like, nothing had been done to it since 1940. It was a kind of creepy vibe around there and so I never really felt comfortable there you know uh, with my kids I always had a vision of them playing with a white picket fence safely in the front yard and this was like no go a no-go zone you know so anyways I heard this crash it was like what the fuck was that anyways I didn't see nothing so get back to it you know it kind of startled me in the middle of that emotional like at your weakest moment type of thing and like five minutes later my wife and kids came home from school and she's like someone's laying in the street and I was like, oh, my God, I knew instantly that 
that's what I heard that someone got hit by a car. So I, I was like, stay here. I'm going to go see if I can help. And they were watching from the bay window and, and I, I ran out there and there was this girl laying face down and she was covered in blood and just, well, she wasn't laying face down. Her, her body was face down and, and her, her face was to the side and, and she was looking and, and there were already people there helping her and she had a jacket over her and, and we were clearing traffic and there was, we were waiting for an ambulance and she'd been hit at about 40 miles an hour head on and hit the windshield, which was pretty obvious. And um, the guy who was hit her was standing there next to me. He was a nervous wreck, you know, because that's a really busy crossroads where four or five schools get out at the same time. And it was just, it's an accident waiting to happen. In fact, there's been a lot of stuff there. So, I'm standing there and she's just moaning, looking at me covered in blood, making this sound like <gasps> constantly like, and I'm just like, oh my God, the ambulance can't get here quick enough. And who are all these strangers around? Everyone's helpless. And we're just like panicking, you know, and then a crowd accumulated. And, and I was thinking, what can I do? And she's looking right at me, dude. It's like, she's just staring at me. It was really uncomfortable. And I, I kind of walked away for a second. I couldn't, it gave me the chills, you know? And I was like, no, wait, I need to keep her awake. I need to focus on her eyes and give her attention and just think there's nothing I could say. I was like, we're on a telepathic level. Cause she's about to die, dude. And I was like, let me see if I can do what I do with my kids and try and heal her or something or let her pass through me or some people would think some spiritual guru garbage, whatever. It's like that sort of what else could you do? So I was standing there almost meditating, giving her this peaceful look. And, and she was just there, the same constant motion. And I started like tingling and getting like goosebumps and weird stuff and, and started feeling lightheaded and started seeing like square pixels everywhere. And and I suddenly it was like just me and her and then all of a sudden the, the, her mom came it was like out of a movie suddenly her mom came through the crowd and she was trying to get to her daughter and they didn't want her to see her like that so they grabbed her and she fell to the ground and and she was just like she broke down and, and that broke the connection between me and her too it was like an upsetting thing because obviously the girl could hear her mom and and suddenly I pictured my children and like, what if this was us, you know, like my biggest fear about living here. And, and then I started, I had to lean against the car. And then one, like, I don't know how long it was, but this man picked me up off the ground. He's like, you're right, mate. He just fell. He just fainted. And I was like, whoa. And when I stood up, the girl had stopped breathing basically because they were putting her on a stretcher at the same time. And the whole thing was like totally chaotic. And she, she was, it stopped making the sound. And I was like, oh, my God, she just died. What, did she pass through me? I don't know. And I, I was just confused. And, and I was all sore. I mean, I hit my head and my knee and my hip the way I just ate, ate it on the floor. And uh, and I stumbled, I tried to stumble home across the street. And, and I almost kind of got hit by a car, too. I was like, whoa, I'm just, like, kind of delirious. And and I walked in, and my, my wife was like, what happened? You're white as a ghost. You look like you've seen a ghost. I was like, maybe I just did. I don't know. I don't know. I just, I had to wash myself with water. She gave me a big hug and then it was just like, oh, and my kids were like, why did you fall down, dad? I was like, I don't know what happened. I fainted. I think she died. And then for four hours, I just kept looking out the window and the ambulance was there for a while. And then the police came and, and they were still there for hours. And like, after like, it was almost eight o'clock and I had the courage finally to go and see what happened. Cause there was still this pile of coats laying on the floor and like blood and all this stuff and I, I was like what happened to her because I was like one of the first people on the scene and he said well she did die when they were putting her into the ambulance but they revived her and she's now like on life support she survived with brain life changing brain injuries and we don't really know but there's definitely she'll, life will you know never be the same for her and I was kind of relieved to know that she survived and like I don't know I kind of felt like I helped her or maybe not or whatever, but what can you do? You know? So there I was, I mean, I wrote a lot of stuff on, on my doorstep sitting outside lots of times, just typing things in my phone and every, all I could see now was this road and it just had this reoccurring incident in my head, you know, like her face and that sound. And it was like, Oh my God, this song has to be for her. Doesn't it? I just have to do it. It's like, I have to do something positive for her. And then maybe, when it's done, I can go and give it to her and show her that I, that somebody cared or something came out of like that moment, you know? So 
I, I just basically documented everything in about a 15 page word document, word for word of what happened, what I remembered. And there was poetry in there. And then I, I broke it down. It took me ages, man. And even in the studio, it's like I had a rough idea what I was going to do. And it just I <clears throat> it wasn't coming together because this to me was like the most important thing I ever had to do for some reason. And I don't know. Russ was there. And we were like, nah, I was like, it's bullshit. It's garbage. You know what? I've been working on this song for 12 years, dude. Just scrap it. It's never going to, it's just not going to happen. And then I thought about it. We had one good verse. And then I was like, no way. I have this other melody that I never used that might work. And I tried it and it did. And then the next part came magically. And when, within 10 minutes, it just happened. And I was like, the most important thing is getting the emotion of that day and that experience and the uncertainty of not knowing what's going to happen. And, and like my vision of like, she's too young to die and she hasn't even seen the world or the, the ultimate sunset, you know? So, so it's just not fair. It's like at that moment, I realized that all my problems and everything I was going through and financial ties and materialistic shit relationships, whatever. And you think of that happening to your child and it's like, from that moment, it didn't matter how bad life was. Your life was never going to be the same. And you realize that you had taken everything for granted and how petty all these things are that we were concerned with and like how people overcome loss. Everyone, someone loses someone close to them and they don't interact with people. They all have their own way of dealing with it. Some talk to their dead people at funerals. Some don't. Some just can't face up to it. Some break down and cry. Some don't speak to their closest people. They just disappear in isolation. They all deal with it their own way. And I was like, there's a way that, you know, people need to communicate because it's like, what can you say? I mean, you even feel awkward when you see someone that you know that lost someone close. It's like, I don't know what to say, especially right now. So it's just a really weird thing. And so I thought if I put all of those concepts into this one song, then, then maybe I'll have achieved something. And yeah, so yeah, it's been following me around for years but um obviously i feel better about it now but it's one of them things and to me that was the biggest achievement of the album and it's like you know what i don't care if anyone likes this or not it doesn't mean anything to me it's like it was for her and then i found this i was like okay this has to have a video for it something artistic something that helps relate the feeling and the story it doesn't have to be graphic like the way it happened it just has to be someone else's interpretation of the same feeling and um, I searched online or I, I randomly came across this sand artist from the Ukraine uh, I was looking at some photos and I, suddenly I was like oh what's this animation and I looked and I realized wow this is amazing she had won the Ukraine's got talent for her sand art and it's like projected and she does these things to music in real time. And it's really detailed and spontaneous and just amazing. So, and, and I noticed that she was, um, after that, she started working for children's charity, trying to generate money for kid, um, kids with cancer. And she had a group of 10 girls and, and I was like, and she had been looking at her, her history biography thing. I was like, we have a lot in common, man. I was like, I'm going to write to her and tell her the story and see if she'd be interested in doing a video. And she was like, oh, I read your message and it was so heartfelt and so sincere that yes, I wanna do the video for this song and also painted rust and maybe we can use it as a charity, you know, like to, to gain attention for this one girl named Marina who was an Olympic champion in the Ukraine, but now she's 10 years old and dying of kidney cancer. So that was our goal and and she committed to it fully and she got everything done even before the album was done. So before the album was done, we had three full length videos and um, it was a different angle on things from the average normal metal videos. How are we going to do this video thing with the drummer in Fort Lauderdale, me in Birmingham, Freddie in France, Nick in Italy and Shane here in Birmingham. It's not going to happen. You spend more money on flights than the videos, you know? So I wanted something that just is a, a storyboard for people. And she did it and we managed to release it and generate some money for her. And she's still in need of money, obviously. But um, yeah, that's one of them things. So trying the whole point of the album, it, it's a, a verse in that song you mentioned earlier, seamless integration. It's like to make the best of something bad, to make the most of something sad. That it's like as bad as life is, we have to make something 
out of it or else what do you do you can curl up and die or just get over it or put it out of your head brush it under the carpet making something out of it is the best release like writing poetry or feelings draw a picture sketch it i don't know just whatever it takes to get it out of your system and something that other people can relate to. So it was like back when I first learned to play guitar, um, I was like 13, no 14. I got my first guitar and within I was, I learned a few things, but within four months of that, I was in a three wheeler on a three wheeler accident uh, on a three wheeler. I put my foot down and got caught in the back wheel. It just shredded my foot to bits. And, um, I had surgery, skin grafts, and I couldn't walk for two months. I missed the first two months of high school. And in that time, I was home, lonely, isolated, and I looked into my instrument, and then I started writing basic Righteous Pig songs, which were like crazy. I had a vision based on all my music that I grew up listening to and something, the next logical extreme, that's what I wanted to do. And eventually I learned to play guitar through that. And if it wasn't for that, I would have been out partying with my friends, going to the mountains, going to the lake and starting high school and this, that and the other. So even though something was bad, when I pinpointed it, I was like, you know, that's actually what, where I learned to play guitar, which actually dictated the next, who would know 27 years of your life later that you're still doing something based on that philosophy. So I was like, let's build on that. And that's really what the whole album was about. I mean, most of the um, lyrics are about personal experience justifying and sort of highlighting the fact of like moving on moving forward and the underlying theme based on like a spiritual and celestial universal way of communication really it's all in there and it does mean a lot to me but you know since it's been done it's like i'm kind of on to the next record already i have a bunch of things i've been working on it so people are just finally getting this. I mean, it's been so long in production. I really needed to stop listening to it, you know? But when I was alone at four in the morning after some show somewhere and everyone goes to bed and I'm still wide awake, it's like, I think I'll just spend some time with this album and listen to it. And lots of times it makes me real emotional and gives me tears. And, you know, I love feeling sorry for myself. Who doesn't, you know? And this is a way of getting past that. I always feel better afterwards. So I think there's something special there that hopefully people connect with it. If not, you know, that's cool. Maybe one day you will, you know, some people just aren't ready for this kind of thing. They just don't know what to really compare it to, which confuses people. They need something that's easily classifiable. You know, the fact that people call it a project is like annoying to me because it's something, it's like my life's work. It's like something I want to build on for the next 10 years. So it's like, you know, I want to take it live and, tour and you know make a living breathing band and in this current climate it's not the easiest task it's like the people that hear it are mainly exposed you know there there's a napalm angle in it it's like advertised as like whoa you won't believe your ears when you hear like how mitch from napalm and shane have done this other thing and straight away it's like there's been a lot of like high profile websites and social medias that have featured the full album streaming and the videos and stuff. But it, if if you're like, I mean, you're talking about stations that only play like Kelly Clarkson and U2 and things like that. And we're getting that kind of support. But those people that read it, they're like, oh, it's a Napalm Dad. Yeah, I heard of that. And it's not my thing. So therefore, I can kind of imagine what it is. And they don't click on the free link. And they just don't because they figured that it's not that kind of thing. So I was like, man, maybe it would have been better to approach as like, not knowing who's in the band and let the music speak for itself. But it's one of them things. You can't get away from it. I don't mind it because it's like I believe in everything I've done. And it's like you're always going to get connected and compared. And, you know, by the time people get their head around this album, I'll be on to the next thing already. So it's one of them. What can you do, Mike? Just like stay positive and hope it's going to be heaps good at the end of it. Jesus, I thought I could talk. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, you don't need to ask me any questions, dude. I summed it up in a nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> I think you did. Well, I was going to ask you the question that if you didn't have music as an outlet, what do you think your life would be like now? Because you're you're a very, uh, uh, you know, what's the word, in touch with your sort of uh, inner thoughts and emotions and, 
and free thinking in a lot of ways. Uh, and a lot of people say they need that kind of outlet to get out such things. What do you think you your life would be like if you didn't have music as an outlet? Yeah, I dread that thought, actually. I've often thought of that. There was a point when it was like 1986, we, we were ready to record the first uh, part of the Righteous Pigs Live and Learn album, and I was 16. I'm still in high school, and at that point, you know, I'd been working on it for a year and a half. And and at that age, that seems like a long time. And when you know you're doing something that it's like if if you don't get it done, someone else is gonna get it done before you and get credit for this sort of style of music, which didn't exist yet, you know. So I, there was this underlying pressure to get it done, get it done, and finally we were ready to record and my brother had this uh, investor who was supposedly going to front the money for the first studio thing which at the last minute never happened and i was just like i was devastated i was like i wouldn't say suicidal but i just gave up on life and everything i was like what's the point if i'm not going to get to do my what if i don't get to say what i have to say then how am I going to just live? It's like there wouldn't be love or happiness or anything, really. I mean, if it wasn't for music, then maybe I would have did something else, art or video or film or I don't know. I just couldn't see myself as going to school to be a lawyer or I was done with school. I was more like a social person and the kind of guy that wants to, I don't know, do something important to myself that just, you know, it's like when you, when you find something that that you believe in, then you could fully dedicate your life to it. And it's like, if not, it's like, how could I fully dedicate my life to something I don't believe in? Like these jobs on the list that they're forcing you to say, what are you going to do after school and all this? I was like, I want to be a musician, but it's not that easy. And the kind of music we were playing, it was like, it's not, it's really hard. So thank God, my parents, I mean, I think it was like two weeks and I just was like dead inside, really. My parents could see it. They were really worried. And in the end, they just said, you know what? We've been thinking about it. And me and dad and your uncle, we're going to give you 600 bucks to go in the studio and record. And and they lent me the money. And I, I was promised to pay them back and basically went in, recorded the songs. And then I had that. We didn't have a record label or anyone but I was convinced we're doing an album. There's no point in just going in and demoing, pay money, and then redo it. It's like it has to be documented and put out. If it sounds good or bad, it doesn't matter. So, yeah, that helped because once that happened, I got the spark again. I was back to my old self. And um, then it took a year and a half from there to find a label to put it out. Mick from Napalm, the drummer, actually helped. Uh, he suggested Marcus from Nuclear Blast, and, yeah, he put it out. So then we had to mix it and he funded it and it finally came out and I was like, okay. And that time I was pushing the demo and, and just like sending everything out, doing a whole mail order, like managing the band and t-shirts and everything. It was like a hundred percent full time, just like you 24 seven and uh, living and breathing it. So it's like, that's what I needed really. And if not, I don't know, man, nothing would have really satisfied me. So I'm lucky that I was given the chance to actually spend the time that is necessary to do it because if I was, if it was a part-time thing and I was at work so many days I was working with my uncle hanging wallpaper in like 43 Celsius weather in Las Vegas and just hearing the radio and always getting ideas and thinking I'm just wasting time here, man. I need to like do one thing, man, not two things. This is not a side passion. So luckily, yeah. And then I joined Napalm and, and we managed somehow to get to the point where we could continue music to focus on 100 percent and then then it becomes second nature after a while so and you realize you grow as a person i mean we're playing music which i was totally into when i was 16 you know so it's like you're 43 now and you go okay well it's time to um there's another side of me and a whole other lot of music that i like how can i combine that into one thing it's like to make the next 10 years more adventurous and yeah that's it really well, let's talk a bit about uh, the new Napalm Death record. Of course, you've already just released, uh, uh, well, previewed a live track recently at the uh, 
the what is it the Roadburn Festival in uh, Holland, dear Slumlord. So, is the album nearly finished? What can we expect from it? I know it's it's always going to be Napalm, but how do you feel about you know Napalm music even now? Just I mean, being doing it for so long, you know, it's like putting on a, it's like a comfortable pair of shoes, and and a lot of people know exactly what to expect. You still feel challenged by it? Well, I would say that one the beauty of Napalm is that. Nobody really knows what to expect from the album. They know it's going to still be Napalm, but it's going to be from a slightly different angle every time. It's going to have a different approach and a different color feeling or something like that. Um, so the last three albums to me were like a trilogy in a way, like uh, The Code is Red, Long Live the Code, Smear Campaign, and there then Time Waits for No Slave. So I was like, okay. Utilitarian has to just start a kind of different level of like what we're trying to do. So these songs that I used for the new Napalm were also part of the hundred songs that I did. So they were just there just sitting here for the last three years and we started talking about the new album. So I was like, oh, let me listen back and see if any of that was good because I didn't have, I never really finished them. You know, it was just like work in progress type of thing. So I looked into him and I showed a few things to Shane and he was like, yep, 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 yep. So I was like, okay, cool. Well, it's kind of weird because I was expecting to write something, but the fact that I already have this and I wouldn't be able to write this style now, now that I've been through the Menace album and like what I want to do with that. So I'm like, let me just fine tune these songs and see what you think. So I sent them to Barney and, and they were like, yep, yep, yep excited actually it's better than the last album stuff it's more intense i was like well i kind of covered a lot of areas in menace that like i don't want things to overlap and go oh well now that sounds like it could be menace and this and that. i hate that when i do a project and it's like suddenly things start sounding the same and it's like you realize you got your fingers in too many pies so this was completely removed from the menace album and maybe not even that much in line with utilitarian because it's more i was like i want to make the song the song shorter and to the point and like just there's no unnecessary bits i'm not trying to achieve that everything in one album anymore this is like my version of what i think napalm should be this time around and um yeah it's intense as fuck really it's kind of nostalgic and there's some groundbreaking parts as well and um it's quite memorable stuff and it's it's direct and in your face and it's like well really what more do you want from an apom record so we went in i went in with danny and and uh and we all we recorded 10 songs and shane's got another five songs done and it's kind of weird because we wanted to do it in different sections to get different drum sounds and you know like different guitar tones and whatever different feelings and different days over months apart and with Russ's schedule, the producer, Russ Russell, uh, it's kind of weird. You know, we're doing it in different sessions. We're going to finish the guitars at the end of August and, you know, uh, hopefully have it done by October. And then we're, we're looking at 2015, January, all being well, you know, if everything goes to plan, because like we, we've been trying to do it for the last six months, but then we got offered this tour and that tour and we were like, okay, well, we'll put the album back and, it's kind of dragged it, dragged it out, but it didn't make any difference to me because I was just waiting for the call, really, and it all worked out good. So we'll see uh, what people think. Well, really. looking looking but, at the scene today, I mean, there's a billion new bands, and all of them want to be more extreme than the other. And I mean, sometimes I don't know if they even realise a how long Napalm have been doing it for, and still, to me, on top of the game as far as the releases and 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 whatnot. Do you really pay attention to any of the new extreme bands anymore? Do you think, what do you think is missing with some of these bands who, you know, just want to be extreme for the sake of it? I mean, well, it all depends on what you qualify as, I mean, classify as extreme. It's like to me, if it's, if I've heard it five, ten, a thousand times before, then it, it loses its, its edge. It's like eating the same veggie burger every day. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, the same. It's like wearing the same. It's the same. How is that extreme anymore? It's like, obviously, you know, there's only so far you can push the levels of like speed, heaviness, down tuning, screaming, growling, speaking, rapping, whatever. It doesn't matter. It's like the combination of new elements and other genres of music 
is what makes it interesting. Like when I go back to my, I, it's like, I don't care if it's extreme. It's like a song is a song regardless of genre. And it's like, as all these people, there's a lot of kind of narrow minded people that are just into one thing. They may be young or they may be like, that's the kind of music. That's the way I like my music. I hate my job and I want a release. I want to scream my head off and mosh around on the weekend and let my frustrations out, which is cool. But for me, when I think back in like, say the mid eighties, like all the bands I liked the hardcore, like metal is whatever it was. It was like all those bands then had an identity. So, like, let's just name a few odd bands. Like, okay, Slayer sounded like Slayer, and then there was Dark Angel, which also had something in common with Slayer, but there was a different feel. And then there were two thousand bands a few years later that tried that started like playing like that because that was all they knew and that was all they wanted to do. So they had that covered. It's like Metallica was unique. The vocal, the songs were well written, and the vocal style was totally different. So they were unique and you had Venom, which was unique and they all had like different themes and some were satanic and theatrical and others were not. And then, then you had bands like say, uh, High Rex, whether anyone heard of them or not, it's like, yeah, they were a little faster and some good riffs, not the best drumming, but the vocals were unique and they, maybe not for everybody. Cause it was like a power metal vocals over thrash. And it's like, then you had, um, DRI, for example, and those vocals and the political edge made them unique. And you had COC, they were also political, but the vocal, it was a totally different style and everything, you know, attitude adjustment or this band Celtic Frost, they were unique. They were slower and heavier and had a different vocal style. And, and when Napalm and Cryptic Slaughter came out and then they had a different vocal style and they were faster. And then their mock could be compared to them, but they were also unique and they had a different, they were less political and more like a party band. And everyone had their own identity, their own theme, different vocal styles. Those are the bands that stood out to me, GBH and The Accused. And I don't know, I can name a thousand bands, but that's missing now. It's like most of these kids grew up with the same bands that were finally made it on vinyl and or albums and they all grew up with the same thing from say 1990 onwards so the scene kind of they all listened to the same bands and they all became the same to me and then at the end of the day it doesn't matter as long it's like there's some bands we tour with that I, I didn't think much of to begin with, but by the end of the tour, I'm like, you know, they have some really good songs and some memorable moments. And I got a few things stuck in my head. That's good. I didn't realize how good it was. And now I see why people like them. And then there's other bands that are even more popular. And I'm like, there's not a song to be had. I've, I've watched them enough times and there's nothing sticking in my head. And so for me, that that's where it gets lost. So it doesn't matter what style, as long as the songs are like memorable or like, I don't know, something about it, well-arranged, <clears throat> things like that. That's what makes it interesting for me. So, but 10 points, like I said, it's all about venting and having your creative outlet. So I don't give a shit what anybody does. If they're happy and they believe in it, then just do it 100%, you know. But for me, I'm exposed to it like quite a lot and I'm always looking for something original and unique and the next level of like, the logical like a mixed amalgamation of everything in music in one band then i'll go god damn that's amazing you know but it's it's been a while you know so therefore i listen to the radio and incorporate ideas from there and stuff but as long as someone's pouring their heart out then I, i'll just say do it man follow your dreams you know well, we can get you to choose your favorite Napalm track off any record and uh, your favorite Menace one, and hopefully we'll get to see Menace possibly as a live band. Is that something you're working on quickly? Yeah, we're going to start in, in America, I think, and we're looking at towards the end of October doing like whatever we can. I'm, I'm looking into management aspects. We're trying to get onto a tour, something interesting, something more varied because, you know, there's a lot of thrash bands we could play with, but I don't know if that's the kind of audience that would appreciate it or, you know, so we'll see. But yeah, still lots to do. But I, I definitely, that's my deadline to want to do something because 
if we don't follow it up with live shows, I mean, I have a whole vision for that side of things, especially with all the videos projected and things that it'll just be seen as another project, which is what I didn't want. So I wanted to at least reach some kind of potential by the end of the year and uh, take it from there, really. Um, my favorite Menace track. Hmm. It's like I've drawn a blank. I would probably say to the marrow, man. You know, it's not an instant track. It's not for everyone. It's the kind of thing that sinks in over time. To the marrow or drowning in density, because that song had an almost uplifting, bright and airy vocal line, and that that was the point where I thought this is the cutoff point. This is where Napalm fans are gonna go. This okay, everything else was cool up until now. This is like happy shit. I'm like, well, it's not really. If you look at the words, it's the most miserable song you've ever heard in your life. So there was contrast in there and something about the feeling for me, it just gives me goosebumps. So somewhere, you know, it's a happy, sad kind of thing. So, and for Napalm, the Wolf I Feed really is the track for me. I don't know, from the last album, that's the one that, that's the most interesting to play live because I got all these things to deal with, you know? So that's it really. But thanks for your time, Mitch. Again, a true inspiration, and it's great to have uh, you know someone like yourself still uh, active in the scene after doing it for God knows how long. It's enough to put anyone uh, with their jaded shirt on, and the fact that you still you know forward through with passion and conviction is uh, to your credit. Let's check out some menace now and napalm death. Thank you, Mitch. This is AndrewHogue.com. Thanks, bro.